And there came a day, a day like no other, when the horror genre stood threatened by the forces of evil. On that day, the horror show with Brian Keene was born. Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Dave Thomas, Matt Wilderson, along with occasional co-hosts Kelly Owen, Phoebe, and Dungeon Master 77.1, these ambassadors of horror stand at the door bringing you the biggest names in the business, as well as tomorrow's superstars. Now, here they are, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. That's right, and we are back again with The Horror Show with Brian Keene. I am Brian Keene. Joining me, Matt, Dave, and Kelly. Mary is off sick again. Uh, she's trying to save her voice to record some new episodes of Cosmic Shenanigans this week. But I'm very glad to have all of you here. Um, Dave, uh, you would, you would tease that Phoebe might be joining us today. Is that, is that still, uh, uh, not today works? cause she, she's got something she's got to do. So she's downstairs working on her laptop. So maybe next week, cause okay. obviously well, you she's, know, she's at home. So, you know, who is going to join us later on, uh, today, I do know, uh, the Shirley Jackson and locus award nominated professor whose books include the divinity student, the tyrant, the narrator, the Gollum, and the just released. Do you mind if we dance with your legs? I am, of course, talking about Michael Cisco, a long-awaited interview, and we've got it here for you in the second half of the show. Uh, but before we do that, we have some news to talk about. And before we talk about the news, we have some personal stuff to talk about. Uh, Matt, let's let's kick it off with you. Uh, you launched a brand new podcast this week. Uh, yes. A, a miniseries. Mm-hmm. Uh, an evening with Victor Ravenscroft. Now, now, who is Victor Ravenscroft? That's just the character I made up. I uh, it's it's a mixture of one of the names I wanted to name my first uh, born son would be either Victor and then uh, Ravenscroft after the guy who voiced Tony Tiger. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like one of the best last fucking names you could ever have. Um, I did not know that was his name. That's actually a really cool name. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's what it, it, it. Yeah, I think it's Ravenscroft or something like that. It, it's yeah, it's pretty enough. awesome. Yeah, but uh, I just uh, I wanted to do something a little different than a normal podcast, and I thought you know there's been a lot of people reading like stories and stuff online lately, so I thought I was gonna jump in, read some stuff from like scary stories, a treasury that I hold dear to me because that started me like wanting to write and everything. So uh, just thought I'd read some of my favorite stories, put some music and sound effects in there. Create a character, bada bing. Now, when you're doing that, is it hard yes. for you to stay in character? Does Matt slip through? Like listeners to the show, of course, have heard your uh, your fake Alex Jones impression, which we haven't broken out in a while, and we it's really been a little while. <laughs> it has been a while. <laughs> when you're doing Alex Jones, I mean, even watching you do it in person in the studio, that character consumes you. You become that character. Is it the same with Victor Ravenscroft, or, or does Matt sneak in there? I mean, I don't have a mirror watching myself, but um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't think so. Yeah. But right. I know there's some times where I'm trying to do the uh, the impersonation and, like, some other characters slip in there that uh, – I don't mean to have there because like I'll screw up the accent and then it sounds like Nicolas Cage or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should leave those in. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Ladies so, and gentlemen, Nicolas uh, Cage is joining us. <laughs> so now it's it's a limited series. How many of them are you going to do? Do you think? Uh, when I first had the idea, I was going to just do it all through April, like every Saturday this April. But then I realized I started it a week in, so I'll run it to like the first Saturday of May. So it's yeah. four episodes. Cool. And people can find that. Of course, uh, it's if you're listening to Grindcast, if you're already subscribed to Grindcast, and you should be subscribed to to Grindcast at this point, people, uh, it'll just pop up in the feed because it's it's running through the same feed as Grindcast. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're also playing uh, new episodes on Brian Keene Radio uh, 24 7. Um, speaking of which, this coming weekend, Brian Keene Radio, Brian Smith is the guest DJ. And uh, so he'll be playing music, and then we'll, we'll be playing Matt's new podcast as well. That's the only two things 
on air Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So very, very oh, cool. You're making That's me cool. blush. Stop it. <laughs> I can't see. I can't tell if you are. And I can see Dave and Kelly here on Skype, but you're just a little circle. <laughs> oh, I mean, the picture I chose didn't even show up. No, it's there. No, we, we can oh, see okay. that. It's, it's you with your juice you. cup. But... What are you up to? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's like it's like Dave said, my camera's a Microsoft product, so it'll choose to work when it wants to work. <laughs> Kelly, what about the you? name goes on? <laughs> Kelly, you've got something you're working on too. In fact, it's gonna be uh it's gonna be live this Saturday on YouTube. Tell us about that. Yes. Um so Scares that Care was going to go to Wisconsin this year. And unfortunately, because of coronavirus, that got canceled. And several of us who were supposed to be there were just talking one day and we're like, well, we should do something like on YouTube or something. Just because a lot of people who are writers and a lot of people who are fans are really bummed at some of the cancelings that are happening because it's kind of the only time of the year that they get to see each other. Right. Yeah. So we decided, screw it. Who's supposed to go to Wisconsin? Let's put them all in a room. So this Saturday, we have like a literal full day planned. And Joe Ripple from Scares of Care is going to kick us off. Nice. And introduce the idea and talk about scares. And and I know that people are tight with money right now. And we're not saying give money. We're not saying do any of that. But if you can yet, then there will be links available for scares. There will also be links available for all of our guests if you want to go buy books. And right now, the guests are... Jonathan Jantz, me, Brian, Mary, Bob Ford, Tim Meyer, Matt Hayward, Wes Southern, Summer Cannon, Wiley Young, Steve Kosniewski, Aaron Dries, and Bracken McLeod. Wow. And then, and then to make it fun, the moderators, because we have readings and panels, the moderators, I decided we should use people who review all of our horror books. So the moderators are Sadie Hartman. From Mother Horror from Nightworms, mm-hmm. Bob Pastorella from This Is Horror, Steve Pate from Horror DNA, and Shane Keen from Ink Heist. Wow. Nice. So nice. it's a what? fantastic gathering of a whole lot of people. I like that you have you have Shane. Uh, he and I can finally settle the rumor that, that we are, in fact, related. Uh, because we are not. He just has a good name. Yeah. yeah <laughs> but so. I'm going to put links up starting. Well, we're recording this on Monday. Um, so by the time this shows up on Thursday, there will be links all over the place on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook for people. People to go um, bookmark the YouTube channel, look at the schedule. If there's certain people they want to see. And while we're doing it live, it will also be recorded for later. But there is a little chat window so people can ask questions throughout. So cool. it was interactive. Cool. And yeah, I, I already some of the, you know, I hate being alone in my house legs. I, yeah. I already uh, picked out the story I'm going to read. It's a good one. Um, I have a half an hour to read, right? Well, you have a half hour to read and answer questions. Okay. I, so I may sure. read two, I may read two stories back to back because they're both very short. So because I have one I wrote the second week of January about the coronavirus uh, when we didn't know it would be this bad. And it's basically this bad in the story. <laughs> and I kind of want to revisit that. You kind of want to read that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good idea. I like that. So, yeah, we're calling it CoronaCon, and it's not to replace scares, but it's in lieu of scares. Right, and it's free to watch on YouTube, so all you need is an internet connection. Um, Now, I I do notice one thing, Kelly. Uh, You, uh, you know, you're friends with Kim Coates from Sons of Anarchy, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know. Every time you get the two of you see each other at a con, he has to come over and give you a big hug. Uh, you missed that hug this year because Scares That Care Wisconsin was canceled. Will Kim Coates be making a guest appearance? Have you reached out to him? No. Um, I actually, there were a couple of people that some of the people involved were like, oh, we should get this person or this person or this person. And we had to cap it. We've got way too many already because. The program we're using to do this, while it does give us 20 hours of recording a month, we're afraid that it caps you at six hours a shot. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. 
we we couldn't quite find the wording that made that clear. Yeah. So, so. if 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 I were to call someone on during, your half hour, you can do whatever you want and hold my phone up to the computer. I wonder. I wonder if that would work. We yeah. should test that out beforehand. Okay. <laughs> no, you can do whatever you want for your half hour. All right. So yeah, couple free things, folks. Uh, again, an evening with Victor Ravenscroft and Corona Con. Uh, we will have information on both of those up at BrianKeen.com. Of course, on Matt's social media and Kelly's social media. Um, so yeah. Uh, both of those this weekend, and we hope you, that you will tune in and support them because we're not asking you for money. It's free. Um, that's something I want to touch on before we get into the news. Warren Ellis raised a good point uh, on Sunday about you know reminding fans and readers to be patient and tolerant of the amount of Kickstarters and GoFundMes and Indiegogos and new Patreon campaigns and all the other stuff that's, that's going to pop up here uh, for basically the rest of the year from creators. Uh, he's not wrong. Um, the comic book industry is, is quite literally circling the drain uh, as our news stories we're about to get into here are going to tell you uh Book publishing, book selling, it's looking grim. Um, and yeah, you are going to see fundraisers like you've never seen before. Um, and I suspect you'll see them from creators who you've never seen do anything like that before. Um, you know, no one, no creator out there is expecting you, the fan, to contribute to each and every one of them. No one has the means to do that, okay? Uh, everybody I think is going to be understanding, but you know, if someone launches a Kickstarter, at least go give it a look. If you can't contribute, you know, then, then help promote it. Uh, cause you're going to see a lot of that in the coming months. Um, yeah. anybody, anybody have anything to add to that? Yeah. I, no, I was just going to oh, go ahead, Kelly. Absolute worst timing. The absolute worst timing for anything. I had a book come out Friday. Yeah. That's <laughs> Yay. <laughs> here's, here's a new book that you may or may not want to get because, well, you know, rent is due and things like that. Um, I plan on getting a copy of it, Kelly. Thanks. Matt, Kelly, you, you both had new books come out, and I just had a yeah. new book come out. I feel like a dick promoting my new book. Do you guys feel that way, too? My yeah, a little bit. My literally says, sorry about the bad timing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this this release date was planned for months. Yeah, and it was it's actually been available for pre order for from the before times. That's what my sister and I are calling before CoronaCon the before times. Um, but it was it was available for pre order, so people were pre ordering it, and then the world shut down. Right. Yeah. So when it actually came live on Friday, it was like yikes. Yeah, I have a little guilt asking people to buy things. I was explaining I that, that. I'm sorry, Matt. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I have guilt asking too, but it also sucks because like, this book was in the pipeline for like six months, planning it and everything, and wanted to get it out to go to Air Studio, and <laughs> all fell apart. <laughs> well, and, my, and mine was coming out in time for scares was the point. Yeah. You know what I like about doing the show on Skype? Dave has a cat growing out of his head right now. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. Attacked yeah. him. I thought he was going to get yeah. taken out. No, I, I have that's to actually that, get a picture. That's Bert. He uh he likes to sit on the back of the chair. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I uh, he's hanging out. I was explaining to Dungeon Master cuz uh my new book Triangle Belief it hit number 2 on Amazon's bestseller list and he's like, "Wow, that's great, dad." And I had to explain to him, "Well, you know, Dad game the system a little bit. First of all, the the bestseller list that it's number two on is religion and psychology, <laughs> which I and, absolutely love. Yeah, you know, and and the the other thing is that you know people aren't buying a lot of books right now, so you know, yeah, it's it's pretty easy for Dad to hit number two. I see Phoebe creeping yes. in over your other shoulder, Dave. She's, she's randomly showed up here. I'll give her the headphones. You guys can talk to her. All right. 
stupid because I, I don't want to do these news stories. Hi. Anyway. They're sad. Hi, Phoebe. How are you? Hello. Now, we have not heard from you yeah. since, uh, since the apocalypse happened. How are you holding up? Um, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> are we on the show now? Yeah, yeah you're yeah, live. Are. Dave should Hi, have told everybody. you. Yes, you're, you're live on the air. <laughs> I'm doing okay. Um, Up until today, I was still working from home. But um, now I'm not because of school. No. Um, it's not public knowledge, but you don't know what school I work at, so that's okay. They're not going to be reopening. Oh, my. Yeah. For, mean, I mean, for, the, school, the, for the school year or for forever? The school year, for the okay. school year. For the yeah. school well, year. I think most of them on this coast are going that direction at this point. Yeah, uh-huh. they, they just haven't made it public knowledge yet. Mm-hmm. So... Well, and as we've been telling the kids, the building is closed. The homework is not. Yeah, I mean, our kids are doing distance learning, so they're good. They're still having school. Right. Mm-hmm. They just, you know, don't need lunch. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's that's got to be. Uh... They're actually doing drive-throughs in the parking lot for people who would normally get lunch. Yeah, for public school, but I'm in private yeah. school. Yeah, she's they're in coming, private they're school. They're coming through and get, getting lunches, which I thought was pretty nice. Yeah. Um, Maybe that's that's got to be pretty pretty harrowing i mean i i'm i'm guessing your health insurance is going to be impacted by that no 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 no. no. what they've done is i'm on layoff so what that means is i still have all my health insurance and stuff i just um have to file for unemployment and um i'm supposed to go back at the end of august um that just depends if the school if the school's going to even open in um, September. I yeah. mean, school will open. It just, I don't know. It's just, um, yeah, it's harrowing. But you know what? Here's my approach to this. Uh, I think the universe can't be any more clear than it's time for a career change. <laughs> 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 and Bert is like, oh, my gosh. Start a catering business. Fuck no. No. Fuck. <laughs> No. no, see Matt's laughing. <laughs> Fuck no. You come make lunch for me and Dungeon Master every day. No, I'm very no. expensive. I'm very expensive. I That's didn't why get I a tell fuck people no, when they, when they, no, you didn't. Um, when people say, "Oh, can you cater them?" I said, "No, I'm very expensive, right, Matt?" Yeah. And they they don't understand anything. how much goes into catering. They do. It's a lot of work, and I don't like it. So there you go. <laughs> so if you're going to um, change your career, what do you think you might do? Um. Well, it has to be something that makes money. Oh, it so, can't be podcasting, though. Yeah, I know. We've learned that lesson, haven't we? <laughs> I, I have to say I have so much respect for you guys that work from home because I don't. I struggled with that for the past, like, month and a half or however long we've been doing this. Ow! Bert! Just bit my elbow. <laughs> it's live, folks. The um, folks, Phoebe is covering. It was actually Dave that bit her elbow. We can no, see it right yeah, here. Really. Um, so it's hard to work from home. I don't, you guys are very disciplined. Brian, I commend you for the discipline that you have to do this because I struggled with that. It's like, I'll do this for a little while, but oh, now it's time to take a nap. <laughs> you you got to You got to treat it like a regular job, you know? And that's, you and that's my regular job is at home. I know. I, I don't know. How you it. So my thought is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, get up every morning and do a project, and I'm looking at going back to school, which is really, really expensive now. Um, but get this, I can't get my transcripts from when I was at the University of Pittsburgh because anything from before 1990, they don't have access to because they're working remotely. <laughs> So that's amusing. So it's but, just a hurry up and wait situation, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, work on my resume. And um, honestly, accounting or HR, maybe. I I have no love of either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, you got to love math. You got to you got to yeah. love math and you got to be super organized. You got to be crazy anal. And like I've spent a long period of time looking for 17 cents. You got to yeah. really want to be an accountant to go there. I yeah. would just, I would like to point out yeah. that Kelly said crazy anal and neither Matt or I took the bait. <laughs> <laughs> Let the record show. 
You are. That's very kind of you. If Mary was here, you she would have taken know. the bait. But yeah. you also know how insanely organized I am. Yeah, I mean, I I do a de- small degree of accounting in what I do. Uh, maybe accounts payable. I don't know. At this point, I wish I could just pet puppies and kitties all day, but that doesn't pay. <laughs> sure, it does. Not enough. Not you can enough. open an animal shelter. Do you see Dave's face? No. Dave can't hear us. Oh, they said I should open an animal shelter. No. <laughs> <laughs> he says, no. Um, no, so you know what? I'm going to see what happens. Um, and I'm going to just try and be positive about this. I'm thankful for the um, – that this is happening now because it's, it's – although it's a financial impact, it's not as horrible as it would have been um, – if we didn't have the extra government unemployment for now. So I'm trying to be positive, but it's, it's, it's hard. I think this is the most serious Phoebe's ever been on the show. Wow. Yeah. Uh-huh. This is a very uh-huh. serious Phoebe. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it's an adjustment. I've worked since I was 15 and now that I'm 35. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, hang in there, hon. I will. You guys, uh, thanks for letting him back on the show. He needed this. Who, Dave? Yes. Well, it's not like he really gave us a choice about letting him back on. Well, I know, but it works out <laughs> that you're doing it online so he can you know, join in. It's nice to hear him laughing and talking with you guys. And, uh, oh, Kelly, just so you know, I'm considering doing some videos on how to make bread. Goddamn bread. I hate bread. <laughs> I fucking hate bread. I make hockey pucks. If there's yeast involved, it's a freaking hockey puck. I got two different recipes off of Google for non yeast involved bread things yesterday to try to make rolls. But and I made. They look yeast. freaking snickerdoodles. They don't even look like rolls. Well, I <laughs> have a couple of recipes that are so simple because I'm not a bread baker either. These were simple. I can't what? make bread. Well, I'm. I just if I I'll post them on Facebook if I do. So yes, to please. help you a little Patrick bit. Patrick sent me one too. Everybody's been sending me bread recipes. Like, oh come on, you can do this. No, I can't. But you know what? There's a whole lot of things I do know how to do, and I'm really comfortable with that. So it's all good. <laughs> That's good. Too. I will keep Pillsbury in business all by myself. <laughs> it's fine. All right, guys, back to your regularly scheduled shenanigans. Oh. All right, good seeing you, everybody. Bye. All right, I don't know how to seg from Phoebe uh, into the news, but we're, we're just going to do it. Um, let's just say before we, we move on, wait, what? Mo's here. Oh, Mo's. Um, now Yay. it's probably knowledge. Let's not forget GoFundMe, uh, help Dave Thomas. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't want to live in my car. <laughs> well, exactly. And after yeah. after the news Phoebe just gave us, absolutely, it's important yeah. to point that out. GoFundMe.com slash Dave Thomas. Oh, Dave Thomas. You see yep. the picture of Ice Bat? Um, you know, that's me. Speaking of yep. Ice Bat, uh, this, is on my, this is her cup, but we have these all over the house. The Chris Enderl awesome. Um Awesome. So. I have a whole bunch of those. Yeah, no, I just, I, I, I love that thing so much. I, I love showing it off. So, uh, but uh, yeah. I'm glad you guys talked to her because it's been very stressful. You know, we're sitting here laughing and, and joking, but it's bad. <laughs> well, it is. Um, you know, it it's, is. It, I, you know, went through a horrific experience. She went through it with me, you know, even though she didn't have the surgery, but she's, you know, been helping me and stuff. And, you know, things might start to get better. And then now there's this. So, <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, we're trying. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> well, no, it's. I mean, you're right. It's bad. It's bad for everybody. Um, bad for, I, I, yeah, I don't. Want, I'm not saying that I'm the only person on Earth having a problem because we all are, you know. But right, you know, it's just, it's uh, it's bad at Macmillan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Macmillan Publishing has laid off uh, a number of employees across all divisions. Uh, they have reduced pay uh, for another group of employees. Uh, they've implemented a hiring freeze. Um, the Thomas Dunn imprint has been completely closed down. It will not reopen, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, the Thomas Dunn imprint, uh, published my last mass market novel, uh, it's pressure. Um, you know, basically they're, 
you know, they're they're doing cost saving in response to the pandemic. Uh, the salary reductions are going to last at least through June. Um, they're structured according to salary level. So, you know, the the low level employees who are making 60000 a year or less, they're not going to see an impact. Uh, but, you know, the folks making the big money above that uh, will will certainly be feeling feeling the pinch. Uh, as far as tour and night fire go, uh, the horror show has confirmation that, uh, the, the layoffs will not impact night fire. Uh, it's still proceeding as planned. Um, so that's good news. Um, but yeah, I, I knew a lot of people at McMillan, uh, a lot of people at Thomas Dunn, uh, several of which have, you know, been directly impacted by this and, uh, you know, we just we wish them the best uh, yeah. again, you know, as Dave just pointed out a second ago. And as we were talking about what Warren Ellis said a few moments ago, you're going to see a lot of fundraisers, folks, in the next few months. Um, nobody expects everybody to contribute to all of them. But you don't complain that you're being overwhelmed with them either, because people just aren't going to have a choice. Exactly. Um, our friends over at Valancourt Books are also uh, getting impacted at a very hard time. I talked with Jay over there on the record. Uh, He tells me, quote, we've had problems with Amazon delisting our titles randomly for years. Usually, though, it's only a handful of titles, and they're usually ones that sell very poorly. So we figured it's some kind of algorithm that's removing slow-selling stuff. But this morning, when I checked, I found 86 books that it had their buy buttons removed. And that was just, Jesus. From, yeah. He says that was just from their 2014 to 2020 releases. Uh, he didn't go back and check 2005 to 2014. Um, he says it includes some of their best selling titles. Mike, Michael McDowell's black water and cold moon over Babylon. Uh, Robert Morasco's burnt offerings. Joan Sampson's the auctioneer, Lisa Tuttle's, uh, nest of nightmares. Um, that was from, you know, the paperbacks from hell series that they're doing with Grady Hendrix. Uh, okay. yeah. um, these are books. Understand these aren't books. They're selling, you know, two or three copies a month. These are, these are the bread and butter. Of mm-hmm. You know, the, the, this is, uh, this is their big sellers. 86 books. Um, now here's the rub. Amazon's delisted them, you know, take away the buy button. Uh, but they've left the the Kindle and the Audible editions available, so they've only delisted the paperbacks. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, Is it, they don't want to mail them. Well, no, because you can you can order it on there from a, a second party seller, you know, like a used bookseller, or you know these resellers. Right. You, you can still get. Well, oh, yeah, but they're not in charge of those. If they're doing their own shipping, I noticed that with a couple of things. Well, I, you know, I don't know because Valancourt does their books through Lightning Source. Um, I know my self-published stuff and all of J.F. Gonzalez's stuff, we're using the same thing Valancourt's using. We're using Lightning Source. And my stuff, they're still shipping it as of today. In fact, I just placed an order for uh, Triangle Belief. I was going to do a giveaway. Um you know, I told Jay, we were, we were talking about this last night. I told him I've had this happen with J.F. Gonzalez's books where I would put stuff up posthumously and the little robot algorithm that Amazon's using would flag it and say, oh, this is a copyright violation. Brian Keene's account doesn't have the rights to publish J.F. Gonzalez's stuff. And every time Kathy and I, Kathy and I would have to show proof of death every time to a different Amazon employee until finally one of my insiders at Amazon actually got it straightened out for me. We haven't had to do that anymore. I don't know that that's the case here with Valancourt, however, and, and Jay didn't seem to think it was the case either. Um, you know, so he goes on to say, quote, we have no way of knowing whether this is just another example of why you don't let robotic algorithms run bookstores. I agree with that. Or whether there's something, you know, something else involved. Um, you know, he suggested an example would be forcing people to buy the Kindle and Audible editions instead of the print because Amazon would get a bigger cut. Uh, but he, he stresses they don't know. 
He says, all we do know is there's nothing we can do about it. The books are all done through Lightning Source, and, and they will rebroadcast the metadata, metadata to Amazon, uh, which sometimes gets the books to show up again, but it usually doesn't. Uh, he says he's actually emailed Jeff Bezos directly. Uh, he's gotten a response in the past, but this time he's not getting any response. What Jay would like people to do, and this is important, listeners, okay? If you take one thing away from this portion of the show, make it this. Uh, you can buy the books directly from Valancourt. You don't have to buy them on Amazon.com. True. And that's not just Valancourt. Subterranean Press, Cemetery Dance, uh, Thunderstorm Books, many others still have their warehouses open. Now, you know, they're, it's, they're down to one-man operations at this point because of social distancing, etc. But they are still processing orders and shipping books. Um, now is the time. We always, we all like to make a big show of, oh, yeah, support independent publishing and support mom and sh- pop bookstores, and, you know, support the little guy. Now's the time when you can actually fucking support the little guy. Yeah. Okay. Instead yep. of buying it on Amazon, go to valancourtbooks.com. V A L A N Court, just like the place where I have to go once in a while. Books.com. <laughs> <laughs> Although I haven't had to go there for, for trouble. Last the, the this year it's only been for jury duty. So um, but yeah, valancourtbooks.com. Place your order and they will ship it to you directly. Um you know, and and not for nothing, but they've got free U.S. shipping. Okay, everybody likes. Well, I can get it free with Prime. Well, yeah, you can get it shipped free from Valancourt too. So, you know, that's that's really something to think about right now. And as I said, Valancourt, Cemetery Dance, Subterranean, Thunderstorm. I'm sure there are others mm-hmm. that are also selling and shipping directly. Uh, Maybe that's something we should talk about next week, actually. Matt, remind, that's a good idea. Me, remind me that this week, okay? All right. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what's going on. Everything is terrible all the time is is the new <laughs> title of Pretty much. this podcast. Um, you guys get anything else before we get to Michael Cisco? Uh, the only thing I want to say is just in case you or anybody has not watched it yet, please go watch the movie Parasite. It's on Hulu right now, so you don't have to pay for it. Uh, we actually rented it because we didn't know it was coming on Hulu, but it seriously is the best movie I've seen in years. And the less you know about it before you watch it, the better. So don't even watch the trailer. Just watch the movie. Yeah, Will do. Yeah. It's it's really good. I uh, I showed Dungeon Master the, the new Planet of the Apes trilogy, not the right. old ones, but the, the new remakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one I had forgotten opens with the... the I was going to say the, the second stories. one is... The second one's literally what we're doing right now. Yeah, it's it's all <laughs> news footage from the pandemic. And, you know, there's like the mayor of New York, you know, saying stay at home, shelter in place. If you must go outside, wear a mask and wash your hands, etc. Well, Dungeon Master's mom, because we were watching it over at her house, she comes into the room while he and I have this on. Oh. <laughs> she did not know it was Planet of the Apes. She thought I had... CNN or Fox, right. one of the news channels. Oh, yeah. And I was letting him watch that. I had to explain, no, this, this is the movie. <laughs> See, you should have let it go. And then when we got to the, the Planet of the Apes part, you're like, wow, this is really scary footage. You know, to see how long you can keep this <laughs> Kind of like that time you guys. <laughs> that's this, there was a that's what New York's going through right now. <laughs> wow, wait. We're wow. bad people. Bad people. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, we're stuck in a house. We have to think of ways to entertain ourselves. So That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right, let us go to Michael Cisco, and we will catch you on the flip side, folks. Okay, joining me now is an author whose books include The Divinity Student, The Tyrant, The Narrator, The Gollum, Unlanguage, Secret Hours, and the soon-to-be-released Do You Mind If We Dance With Your Legs, as well as many more. Uh, he's the winner of the 1999 International Horror Guild Award for Best First Novel and a nominee for both the Shirley Jackson Award and the Locus Award. Uh, I am, of course, talking about Professor Michael Sisko. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I appreciate you coming on and, and classing us up. I mean, you know, occasionally we'll have, uh, you know, somebody like Tremblay or Nick Mamatas on the show. But I, I think you you bring a 
a certain pedigree even above them. So. Oh, shucks. Well, you know, I'm happy to, to elevate you above the riffraff you normally have on, like Mamata's, you know. I mean, uh, uh, those gutter snipes, really. Um, <laughs> so you're uh, you're in New York. Well, we've been trying to set this up for a couple months now. Originally, you were gonna you were gonna come down here for the weekend. We were gonna have you in the studio. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, then life changed for everybody. But you are at ground zero for the world. I mean, has has your has your life changed day to day? Or I mean, yeah. is it very much so? I mean, like we're we're staying inside as much as possible. My wife Farah is immunocompromised, and so we try to go out as little as we can. And you know, I'm no spring chicken myself for that matter. And uh, Queens, where I live, where I am at this moment, is the hardest hit borough right. of New York City, which is the center of of Corona right now. Um, I'm very fortunate because I, I can teach. I'm a teacher, and so I can teach from home. It's weird, but uh, it, it gives me a level of financial security that I know a lot of Americans don't have right now. Um, so that at least hasn't changed too much. This experience of teaching has changed. The whole thing is it's because we don't go outside. We don't actually see it firsthand very much. But in some, right. in some ways, it remains rather unreal and remote. And yet at the same time, we are in the middle of it all right now. And you do notice it in the silence. You notice it in how relatively quiet everything is, how bare the streets are. Right. What you hear is bird song and sirens. Yeah. That's what you have. Bird song and sirens. Um and it's very, it's very frightening there in particular because it's so nebulous. Like you, everything feels normal. Like the, the house is not fire. Right. There's, you know, there, there's no obvious sign of distress anywhere except when you go out on the street and you see how empty it is. And you see people wearing masks. We go out wearing masks now. Um, and yet you know that, that this is, you know, something like 800 people died just the other day. Right. Uh, and so it's strange. It's like, it's, you're in, we're in a little bubble here in the house. We just are staying in all the time and being as safe as we can and just sort of watching it all unfold on the internet. Like every, like as if we lived hundreds of miles away, but right. it's actually right outside. It's actually right outside our door. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, you know, I, my son's mother's immunocompromised and we've pretty much been doing the same thing. And of course, you know, Mary, of course is, uh, is quarantined with her parents in New Jersey. Yeah, you're, um, yeah, you're not you're not together right now. Yeah, it's which ain't difficult. It is, but you know, I was uh, I texted who was it? It was Nick Kaufman earlier in the week, uh, and you know, talking to him, and he's like, you know, yeah, we're fine, everything's fine. I'm thinking, man, you're 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 in the heart of this thing. <laughs> How yeah. in the world can it be fine? You know? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. so you're That's, teaching throughout all this. Yes, and so. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's really weird because you don't get the energy from the students that you'd get in firsthand because I can't really do interactive with them because I teach in the South Bronx. Most of my right. students, many of them are the, – the phone is the only computer they have. Uh, they use computers at the school or they may be sharing computers at home with as many as like four other people. Right. Uh, many of them have kids and their kids are going to be basically doing their education on the computer – so, you know, I moved a lot of my lectures from this kind of an interactive format. I moved them onto YouTube just to make them easier for students to get access to because you can watch that on your phone. Right. Um, so that's really strange. And generally, I mean, my school has been pretty good about trying to be coordinated and to get a coordinated approach to teaching together and to make sure that everybody understands we need to be a lot more flexible about things like grading and so forth to make sure and to give extra help to the students. So the teaching has been a challenge it's actually been more work right. uh, than you would normally do because you got to sort of prep everything for a totally different type of presentation so that's been a real challenge and honestly you know it's like um you know i think you mentioned nick kaufman and i think he lives in manhattan if i'm not mistaken or is it brooklyn ah uh, brooklyn i think yeah it's your experience is going to vary depending on what borough you're in yeah. like you know manhattan you don't necessarily have the kind of problems you have in a place like in the Bronx right now where I teach, they still have rush hour. They still have streets full of people because everybody God. got to work. Everybody still has to work. Right. Right. And of course the majority of people who get the disease in the city, people of color. Right. Right. Because 
They're the ones who are being forced to go out and work. They're the ones driving the buses. They're the ones operating the trains. They're the ones that are driving the ambulances. They're the ones doing all the delivery stuff, all the mail, postal, all that stuff. They're, so they're all out there still. And uh, so that's that's my students. Those are my students. I know at least one has the virus and maybe others. And so it's it, it, that's 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 where we're getting interviews that you write on days when you don't have to teach um in a situation like this do you even find yourself able to write or when you get a day off is it more just take a self-care day and, and recuperate i don't know writing for me is self-care in a way yeah um it's like when i write i really feel like i don't know how it's like for you like um which book was it of your ghoul? I think it was um, the one where you were really writing about your childhood. Yeah. You know? uh, which I think you, I think you do a bit of the same. I, sure. Sure. Which we'll get into here, but, but you tap into something in yourself and you kind of like put yourself back together again. And you bring yourself into focus. Right. I mean, if you're a pro writer all the time, you know, you get to be a writer all the time with all the pluses and all the minuses when you're teaching, You've got this one thing over here, and then your writing's bracketed off over here. And you know, I love teaching, and it's it's you know, it's something that I do because I want to do it, not just because it's like convenient or something. Right. But for, like writing is what I am, and so when I can do it, I feel restored in a way. Um, and so it's not like there's. I just want to keep the energy really clean for when I write. I don't want to like have it all jangled up with distractions about what happened at school today. I want it to be, I want to be able to just focus all my, because I have this crazy brain that's going 30,000 directions at the same time. So if I can get all my attention on a screen for, to write some words, you know, I don't want any competition. I just want to be able to focus on what the <laughs> hell I'm supposed to be doing today. And if I can get some pages done, you know, I feel like I've kind of redeemed my existence for another 24 hours or something. Uh, <laughs> So in a way, it is like self-care, yeah, to me, for me to write. I feel kind of bad if I get through a day and I haven't managed to do anything, you know? Yeah. I mean, it just feels like, I, especially, I guess if we're going to talk about the situation that's around us, it's like that only makes it all the more clear that uh, whatever your condition of health is now, there's only so much time you got to do what you got to do. Exactly. So, so get it done. <laughs> yeah. Book okay, ain't going to write itself and no one else can write it for you, so you got to do it. No, it's it's always been self care for me, and I, I think horror in particular. Even as a kid, you know, because um, yeah, I, I and I suspect you were the same way growing up. I mean, we're very different writers, but I see some of this in your work in the subtext. You know, I horror for me, I I, I was surrounded by very real fears mm -hmm. and horror as a genre it seemed to spark my imagination as a kid and it made those fears a lot more manageable and i i suspect it was kind of that way for you as a kid as well am i wrong no i think it was more like you're not wrong um the thing that I, like people would tell me you know or you you know like um when people would bloviate about horror and they'd say well it's because you know people like to be scared i said i don't like being scared i don't like being scared one bit what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> it's an unpleasant emotion. We do understand that, but I'd also, it was sort of baffling. Then, okay, then what is the wish fulfillment? Like what do, why would you seek that out? And to me, it's like, there's the fear, but there's also the, there's a sense that, I mean, it's the, the, the exhilaration that comes from confronting fear. There's definitely that, but also, I mean, what a part of what enchanted me, because I was, you know, full of all kinds of fear as a child. That's definitely true. And, but at the same time, I was afraid of things that weren't necessarily real. How do I put this? It's that there was a kind of reenchantment that would happen when I would imagine, when, when I would become fascinated by things like ghosts and uh, and monsters, that there was something out there. There was more than meets the eye, that uh, everything hadn't been explained, that it hadn't been all gridded out. So if, there, if okay, you could put it like this. I was afraid of the idea that everything had been explained and everything was predictable and that life was totally planned out in advance and that there was nothing new to expect or no change could really happen. That was, right. I guess, what I was afraid of. And I was, I kept wanting to get, my idea of reassurance was the idea that, well, actually, no, there's still, anything can still happen. I like that. I like <laughs> that. And I know you, you've, you know, you're on record. Tolkien was a big influence on you as a kid. The Oz books, Watership Down. Um, yes. 
in that vein, I, I've never seen you mention this as at an early age. Were there any films or television that you oh, remember yeah. having an impact on you as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a massive, massive Twilight Zone fan from very, very early on. And I still go back to the Twilight Zone all the time. It scared the hell out of me. Um, uh, I love the sort of circa 1960 flavor of it. The sort of yeah. the sort of cigarettes and narrow ties and that sort of grill cream and all that. Just, you know, I really like that. Um, I love the structure. I was fascinated by the the way those flip, those twists would come, the way they would hit, the way they'd be set up, and say, "I've been I've been seeing that queued up all along." And it sounds sort of naive now, but at the time I was into it. So there was stuff like that and Doctor Who. This would have been Tom Baker era Doctor Who. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and like he was, uh, that was fascinating to me. It wasn't exactly horror, but there were, remember, what was that series? There was the one that, a series of stories they did. It was like a Jekyll and Hyde thing. It was like they were visiting the last planet in the universe and there was a guy who drank oh, anti Oh, he um, a monster. Yeah, I can't remember that. I can't remember the name of that one, but yes, I remember what you're talking about. Yeah, it was like Planet of Doom or something. It was like a kind of uh, Jekyll and Hyde riff. Yeah, that I really liked. I remember seeing. Um, there was also a really amazing adaptation of Jekyll and Hyde that I think was played on Mystery when I was a kid. Where um, this would have been made in the '70s, sometime I can't remember the name of the actor who was playing both Jekyll and Hyde, but their conceit was that that Hyde is ugly only for a moment. And then he becomes beautiful. Right. He's beautiful, seductive, attractive, sexy Hyde. Uh, whereas as Jekyll is a sort of stout, red-faced, standard, sort of respectable English doctor type. Right. So the interesting thing was it was Jekyll who was wearing the makeup. In, in It's Hyde with the makeup off. You right. Know? And so that was an interesting approach. And there was just something unsettling about that. Gargoyles. I don't know if you ever saw that when you were a kid. There was oh, the, yeah. not, the, not, the, not the Disney one, but the 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 TV movie one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one because the gargoyles get away at the end, and that freaked me out. <laughs> uh, there were, you know, I watched a lot of kind of uh, just like you know, like horror movies on TV that weren't necessarily good horror movies, but they had um, an unsettling or sickening quality that stayed with me. Um, as far as films go with that I saw as a kid, wow, that could be tough to sum up. Um, I mean, the adaptations that I saw of Tolkien and Watership Down were all very, very powerful to me, and I still go back to them. I, uh, I just tried showing my 12-year-old the, you'll remember, the 70s cartoon adaptation of The Hobbit. Oh, yeah, um, the, the Rankin Bass, of course. Yep, that was the now, one I seen in the first place. Yeah, keep in mind, you know, he's... He's seen, uh, you know, the, the Peter Jackson adaptations, but we went back and watched the cartoon and, and he dug it, but it, it seemed very dated to him. It's you know? rather quaint, I admit it. Um, but if you're going to cast anybody as Gollum, I mean, Brother Theodore, <laughs> I, you're not going to get anyone who does Wretched better than him. It just can't nope. be done. Nope. nope. But I love that anyway. I'm very nostalgic for it. And, and uh, you know, the songs may be kind of quaint or what have you, but. What can I say? I mean, I uh, that was the one that brought that made me want to read the books. Yeah, was, same here, same that's here. What I saw the book. Yep, I saw that I, first, and then I then I picked up the book. Yeah. You knew early on that you wanted to be a writer. Um, yeah. By the time you went to university, I know you studied the Bible as literature. Yes. In college, um, yeah. do you think that influenced you in some way as well? Oh yeah, the divinity student was right out of those studies. I mean, yeah. in particular. I was intrigued by, you know, I wasn't reading the Bible for religious purposes. I was using it mainly, I was interested in it mainly with the idea of eventually becoming an English literature professor. And I had this silly idea that you're supposed to have some sort of familiarity with literature in general uh, <laughs> and with influential works instead of just two or three things on a lot of critics. But the, the, so I thought, well, I've got to know this because there are all these references. And I was intrigued, but first of all, like the Bible is like, I mean, you want critical apparatus. They got it. Yeah. It's be beautiful. Like every word has been parsed and, and examined and weighed and scrutinized. So you, you can get just as granular as you want with that analysis if that's your thing. But what, what got to me was the part passages having to do with prophecy. Right. And what struck me about that was it was this was directly le leading into the divinity student as an idea for the book. It was just that, you know, a prophet, there was somewhere in there where there was the idea that prophets don't just report 
what God wants them to say, but that they have a current kind of agency as to how they say it. Right. They kind of not only they don't just tell people what God's going to do. They kind of speak it into existence. They Words make it happen. Means they can bring it about. Right. They say it. And that's part of the reason it happens. Like there's a human agent that has to say it. And the human agent has some leeway as to how he can express things. And I thought, okay, if, what if we applied that to a novel? So then like, okay, from the point of view of the novel, I'm God. I make the book. So then I have a character in the book who's basically learning, trying to learn my language. Which is different from the language the book is written in, right? Right. I mean, it's all English, but in effect, right? Right. And so that was the, the, the germ idea that this, that you have this like weird relationship with the story writing you. I, all kinds of versions of this. I'd seen this all over the place. Um, I remember there was a Twilight Zone episode. Remember the one about the writer who invents characters and they come to life? Oh, yeah. And he has them on tape? Yep. Little snippets of tape. And it turns out he invented his wife, too. And he says, you know, that's that's enough. And he burns the tape and poof, she's gone. And it's uh, I mean, that's that's I don't want to say it's a trope, but it's something that pops up everywhere from Stephen King to, you know, Gerhard Gerhard von Rad. I mean, yeah, there's, yeah. there's endless plays on that. Um, yeah. Yeah. The fascinating yeah. interplay uh, you know, like I always loved anything that broke the fourth wall. I mean, even if, you know, like you must remember like the old Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck cartoons when they talk to you or the where they would fight with the animator. Oh, yeah. They would try to erase them and they'd be grabbing the pencil and trying to stop the eraser. Anything that did that fascinated me. Anything that that, that brought the cartoons into your world or that blurred the line between you and, and the, the audience and what was going on. That sort of thing just always fascinated me. And I always wanted to kind of play with that. Like the re the book knows that there's a reader reading this book. and will kind of gesture toward that reader. I mean, even if it's like there's a monster at the end of this book, like where Grover's trying to nail the book close, so you can't turn right. the page. So the, he's talking to you. It's like, I'm talking to Grover. Grover's talking to me. This is, you know, it was, I could it, like, that was, I, I guess I never got over this, that. And so I always wanted to write stuff that knew it was written and knew you were reading it and was, would kind of not wink at you or do anything cute, but that would take that into account in some way. Like the right. book isn't about something. It is something it's doing a thing in your hands while you read it. Right. Well, you, I mean, you've said, you once said in an interview, I'm going to quote you. You said, uh, uh -huh. with, with respect to the struggle to read my work, I do make something of a religion out of difficulty per se. <laughs> and I don't know that this is entirely to be despised. I want readers <laughs> who are prepared to contribute something of their own to making the novel work. Um, I want to, them to make something of their own out of what I've done, and I want my work to overwhelm them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go on to say that you know you feel you must be you yourself must be as confused as your characters are. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Right. Do you, I mean, is that deliberate every time you set out to write something? Not necessarily. That you have to know enough about what's going on so you're not wasting the reader's time. That you can't let them feel like you're just floundering, but if you know so it's very tricky it's one of the things i admire most in kafka for example it's like he to write lucidly about confusion i mean anybody can be confused but right. to write about confusion lucidly is damn hard and that's one of the things that so astounded me about about him and in my own work i guess i want i don't want to sit back and see i'm in this weird position because on the one hand I'm, I'm playing this kind of god game thing with the fourth wall i was talking about but at the same time i don't know any, i don't know life better than you do i don't I certainly don't know your life better than you do um you're the god of your own life right so in a way I, i'm talking to another god really through the this weird book that's fucking so beautiful I, you don't solve it right you see, some people are you know they, they get an answer that works for now you know but we're all we're all trying to figure that out. And so that to me is like the most basic level of relating. Like anybody you can relate to anybody else when you just say, like, I don't know what's going on, man. It's like it doesn't matter where you're from, Japan, ancient China. It doesn't matter where you're from. Everybody knows that feeling. Everybody can relate to that. And so, yeah, it's like what I want to do is because a lot of this just has to do with letting the book tell me what it wants. Like I want the book to be alive and right. to say like I've said elsewhere, I think like if, when you hit a block, it's rough, but at the same time, you found something. Actually, what you've done is you found something. The book doesn't want to do this. 
you pushing it and just it's like no no sorry man i don't want this i don't right. want it and then you have to say, okay and then you say okay well why doesn't the book want this? you know maybe you're being coy and you're it's actually you who don't want it maybe you really don't want it so what do right. i really want to do am i trying to fake something am i trying to push something maybe this is a different project than the one i thought it was so what is this project and so when it comes alive, when it pushes back, I figure if it's alive for me, it's going to be alive for the reader. Right. You know, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to listen to what I'm writing rather than decide it all in advance and plot it out and present this kind of, you know, just sort of run the program. Well, you know, in the vein of listening to what you're writing, you know, you, you've you said that William Burroughs, you know, a lot of well, how you learned to write was from William S. Burroughs, specifically audio recordings of him yeah. reading naked lunch in the Western lands. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you hear that voice in your first drafts or does it come later <laughs> on in the process? Yeah, um, oh, you mean like in any first draft? Yeah. In yeah, any it, first draft. Yeah. It all has to be like the way I go about writing usually is that I, I, I kind of run it through my mind a few times before I sit down to actually put anything on paper. Right. If I get, sometimes I'll get a phrasing like exact words and I'll jot it down. And I, of course, I jot down ideas all the time, but normally I want to see it happen. Like I'll listen to some music and I'll just try to see it happen. And I'll see the scene, who comes in where, what happens, who says what to whom. And I'll try to like make it a film in my head. And it's like, I'm seeing it, I'm hearing it. Right. What's the, what does that character sound like? What kind of tone do I want here? And to a certain extent, you know, so it's partially that. And then I sit down and write it. And then sometimes, too, if I'm reading something, like if I'm reading something, like Burroughs has such a strong voice that if you read them in long enough, you, you're going to start sounding like Burroughs. It's going to just yep. rub off. You know, yep. I think a lot of writers, we all start by mimicking our favorites. And if you read too much, you can always read, reading somebody, you can always tell, okay, this guy's been reading way too much of so-and-so because they <laughs> sound just like, it, and they don't know what they're doing. It. And so that, you want to be aware of that, but, you know, you can use that, right? You can say, okay, I'm going to do, do kind of a brosy thing here, but I'm just going to sheet in a little bit of, of this other writer here. I'm going, throw, I'm going to add a little bit of Bernhardt in here. I'm going to throw in, so I'm going to dry this out. I'm going to add some crunchy Lovecraftian adjectives in here through the middle. And so you, and of course you don't know what Lovecraft himself sounded like, but you can read like Wayne June and you hear Lovecraft's right. voice. Or if I'm, you know, Edgar Allan Poe sounds like Vincent Price to me because most of the readings I have are Vincent Price reading him. So I'm hearing Vincent Price doing Poe. Right. Fine. I can use that. <clears throat> but it's whatever just kind of gets your juices flowing. So you're not trapped in the voice. You're using it. It's like anybody. It's like if you're learning, if you play music, you're going to imitate different styles. You're going to oh, do a little Jimmy in here. And then say, now we're going to pull back to some more sort of Les Paul sound and we'll, or what have you. It's the same kind of a thing. And gradually out of that melee, you start to find what works and what doesn't. You start to find your own sound. You start to find your own voice there. So, yeah, that was what was important to me with Burroughs was that I could figure out how to talk on the page. Right. In flow so it wasn't affected. It just gave me more control, more sense of the sound of what I'm doing. So, yeah, the sound often, even before there's a draft, before there's anything written down, there'll be a sound, a voice, or an attitude, and then it just you just let the voice talk and write down what it says. What about like with the traitor? Because the traitor is a first person narrative. So it, yep. was there a longer wait until you found that voice? Yeah, kind of. It's like I, it was hard to do first person, I guess, because those first two books were kind of clinical and I wanted to be like they're very Quay Brothers y to me in my right. mind's eye. Like, I love the Quay Brothers and it was they're very hands off and quiet and standoffish and gestural. And again, the traitor pretty much came, it, it just straight up ripping off Thomas Bernhardt's style. That's what it was. I read a bunch of Thomas Bernhardt. He writes these long, long, long paragraphs. Sometimes not, a novel will be basically a couple of short paragraphs and then one whopper in the middle. <laughs> Lots of repetition. But a fast, you know, it's like you can remember where you were when you heard that Kennedy was shot and things like that. And I can remember like where I, where I was when I heard Reagan was shot. And I can remember where I was when I figured out Bernhardt. Like I was sitting at a table in a restaurant. I had the book in front of me. I was alone. And like I went, oh, yeah, I get what he's doing. Yeah. yeah. And then suddenly I was like, and then suddenly the book unlocked for me. He would repeat things with these slight variations. And I say, yeah, I know what you're doing, you bastard. What you're doing is 
it's like a sculpture. You've done, you've written a sculpture. You can turn it this way and this way and this way and this way. You walk all around it. And so that you found out a way to write that. You repeat things with slight variations and you're turning it every which way. I got it. And so once you get it, then it's like you want to use it, right? You got to right. use it. Now you figure that you, now once you know the trick, you got to do it. And that novel largely emerged out of, you know, A, a desire to do a kind of fantasy novel that wasn't the same old thing. And B, just a need to use this style. Like I had to do something with this style. Right. So good or ill, that's what that's where that came from. Now you said you listen to music while you're while you're jotting down the notes and formulate yes. stuff. Any kind of music, or is there a very specific genre that works for you in that regard? Or mostly instrumental, because yeah. if there are words, the words will often get in the way. Not always. It's changed over time, and it doesn't necessarily have to be classy or good music. It can be trash. It doesn't matter what it is, uh, if it gives me the right feeling. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff I'm listening to, like you know, when I was in college, I guess I was listening to a lot of industrial stuff, and then I was moving more into like you know, like uh, like that kind of paranoid cabaret Voltaire thing with weird. Oh. They were using cut ups too, and right. they were listening to Burroughs too, or you know, th- not so much Throbbing Gristle, but like Psychic TV and those guys, and or Skinny Puppy even. Uh, for all their luridness, they were super earnest, and I really liked that about them. And they were, um, I like the murkiness of the lyrics and how deeply back in the mix they typically were, and the growling. I like little snippets of 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 sort of cryptic quotes. Um, so anything that would give me that atmosphere. So if it was soundtrack music, I would listen to it. If it were, right. you know, like like the Psycho soundtrack is just one of the most beautiful pieces of music, I, you know. You listen, just Bernard Herrmann's score for that uh, is way more than just shrieking violins in the shower scene. There's some really beautiful moving stuff in there. Um, yeah, it was pretty much running the gamut, but um, a lot of the times I'm just like listening to regular rhythmic music without a lot of content in it, just to kind of actually just kind of hold everything else at bay so I can I can think. Right. right? It, it kind of keeps like the lizard brain engaged so that i can just I, I don't have to like listen to every little thing that happens and be distracted by everything that happens i can actually just kind of go into my own mind and see what's happening and sometimes even a piece of music will kind of give me the beats of a scene or the other way around i'll take a, that particular part that's where this happens that's what that feels like right so you know that was the kind of thing that, that i would be looking looking for if that makes sense so yeah, oh, yeah. I, Usually, like I have playlists kind of for novels. I'll have like a folder full of the tracks that I go back to for that feeling. It's like, okay, that scene is going to feel like that. This scene's got to feel that way. And so I can get to the, the the right feeling for that particular moment. I do the same thing. Same exact thing. Cool. <laughs> so, now, there's something I want to ask. Uh, okay. You know, Mary and I, we live together. We're both writers. And, and we discovered very early on that we have vastly different creative processes. You know, mm-hmm. I just, I write a novel straight through beginning to end. Uh, she writes the entire book at once. She might be working on chapter seven today and mm-hmm. tonight she'll be writing the finale and tomorrow she's writing the prologue. Mm-hmm. I have heard, I've never had this confirmed by you, but I, I've heard from mutual friends. You have a similar process that you write the whole book at once. No, no, no. No, actually, as a rule, I write from beginning to end. Okay. I try to write in sequence as much as possible. One thing that happened, I, you know, like the first few, first couple of three books, it was the first couple of books I wrote like straight through beginning to end. Right. And then the Golem, I went back and tinkered a lot. I think it might have been the Traitor was the first, or maybe it was the Tyrant that was the first book where it was all in one big folder instead of a bunch of indiscreet, a bunch of discrete files. Right. Because you know, I wrote The Divinity Student in 1991. I was writing it on WordStar. Like, you didn't write a whole document in WordStar. It was like, it was too big. You had to go chapter by chapter, right? You're it was right. green. It was that horrible green and black and nothing else. And it was control F3 to bold or whatever. And, uh, you know, so it was, there were technical limitations too. But like, once I figured out how to put it all in one file, then, then I noticed I could go, I could move around inside the book and make adjustments. 
And I could say, oh, I want to change this character. I want to tweak this over here, or I want to mention this earlier. So I would do that a little bit, but by and large, I kind of, I pretty much start at the beginning and work straight through. Again, because the book, I, I want the book to tell me where it wants to go. And so if I do decide all that out and then in advance, I kind of feel like, well, if I have a complete outline, why don't I just publish the outline? And right. you fill in the blanks because like it's done. So I need to have, so yeah, I tend to write straight through just so I can kind of see where it goes. I know the, I know it's going to end up there. I know where it's going. It's going there. Some, that's basically the end point. How right. we get from there, what happens on the way. Mm, I, I know this has to happen. I know that has to happen. I know he has to meet her and he has to die. But for the most part, I want the characters and their thinking to kind of guide what's going on. So I kind of have a loose plan. I'm not totally pants eating it, but nowhere near like all worked out in advance. No. Right. Um, one, one other thing I want, cause you know, I don't want to make this interview just about our process. Cause yes, we have lots of writers that listen to the show, but we have lots of readers that listen as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but one thing I do want to talk about that I don't see you get asked about a lot is your translation work. Okay. Um, how hard is it when you, when you're doing that, how hard is it to capture and keep the author's voice and intent and tone and not let your own take over. Um, insanely hard. <laughs> yeah. Incredibly hard. I mean, when it comes to Spanish, you know, like I, I barely have any Spanish. I didn't study Spanish. I was, I'm largely using just sort of what I put, picked up colloquially and then a dictionary and I'm just going real slow. And then, you, you know, so there, the main thing though, is I've read enough, like in, the one story by Cortazar that I translated, I've read a lot of Cortazar. I'm a huge fan. So I can, I know what his voice sounds like. Right. So I, can, you know, I'm trying not to be a bad Cortazar imitator. I'm trying to just sort of find his voice in the words and that can happen, but man, it's tough because it's very elusive. Everything at the end of the day, you're never sure that you made the right decision about any of the sentences in there and you're, it's like a, it's shocking that it works at all um so and you know i'm translating this big this novella by marcel bailu right now as a french writer that i like a lot and uh i think i have his voice down um but you know again i i i'm dependent on other translators basically to to help me understand you know tell me and make sure that i'm getting his voice right so but it is really really tricky it's extremely difficult to be sure i had uh, a translator uh anna hayward who uh mm -hmm. is translating my stuff in russia you know when she first approached me about it she said you know you you should have russian mass market editions and i said well you know russia is the number one country pirating my stuff who who is gonna <laughs> who's gonna pay money for my books there and and she said, no, you don't understand. These Rush, these pirated Russian translations of your books, the translations are terrible. Mm -hmm. If if there's a good translator who's staying true to your, your narrative voice, people will buy them and read them. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't believe her. Um, but it turns out she was right. You know, mm -hmm. they, in, in, in these translations, they... <laughs> they they really want to know what the author really intended to say. You yeah, know? yeah. They want to know what you sound like. Yeah. Um, I, another personal question I've got to ask now, you know, we've, we've been at this about the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, you've achieved something that very few in our generation have been able to do. And that is of course, a centipede press edition. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, don't pop my bubble. That has to be one of the high points of your career, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it was such a thrill. And, you know, I love Jared and uh, I love the, those centipede books, you know, and um, to be offered a chance to do a box set, I was over the moon. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and then that they were so beautifully done. They had such wonderful, um, you know, Paul Tremblay did an intro, Jeff Ford did an intro, you know, all the people, Reese Hughes, all the, all these great writers were doing intros for it. So yeah, absolutely. I was over absolutely over the moon about that. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous book. And I, I can't always afford Jared's stuff, but you know, I like yours and uh Carl Edward Wagner's, of course I snagged that right away. I'm yeah. a big Wagner fanboy. Um but yeah, I mean I, that was just 
just a gorgeous, gorgeous edition. Yeah, his know. library of weird fiction, that series is is amazingly good looking. And I remember yeah. when he when he talked to me about it, he just sent me a box of books. He just sent me a box of centipede books, including these giant art books, you know, like this it's like a coffee table book that you could actually use as a coffee table. It's that big. <laughs> <laughs> and it's this huge slip covered edition of Lovecraftian art. And he just straight up sent it to me like it's a $75 book. And he just, here you go. So that was, he was very generous both with, you know, and, and he paid. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or yeah. Not. You know, so that was, it was a great delight working with him on that one. And then there's, there are plans for doing an anthology of some of my fiction, short fiction with him. We were going to do it this year. Now, I mean, who, maybe. I don't know, right. but uh, there were at least plans to do that this year. Well, that's fantastic. Well, speaking of, of stuff that's that's come out or is coming out, uh, mm -hmm. you know, let's talk about Do You Mind If We Dance With Your Legs? Um, okay. Nightscape Press is bringing that out as part of their charitable chapbook series. Uh, now, this one uh, benefits the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Mm -hmm. um, so talk a little about how that that came about did robert at nightscape approach you or was it something you pitched him he i, I let me think i believe he approached me um i'm not sure i had this written already yeah um and you know i don't recall i think that he approached me about it um but i'm not sure i remember correctly so robert could correct me <laughs> if i'm wrong so if I, I'll, <laughs> I'll tweet i'll tweet a correction if i goof that up well, hopefully we get Robert here on the show at some point too. And he could, sure, he now, did it. you pick? Did you pick the charity, or did he already have a charity in mind? No, the we, the writers in that series always pick the charity themselves. So that's one yeah. of the distinct things about it. They pick the charity. Well, what what about that charity attracted you? What was there a, a connection there? Or yeah, two things. First of all, I mean, the book is set in Los Angeles, and so I wanted an, a Los Angeles based charity as a way of kind of giving back. And I was born and raised in Los Angeles County. I was born and raised in Glendale, glamorous Glendale. Uh, and uh, so growing up in Los Angeles, this this book is, a, I think I sent you a PDF of it if you wanted to check it out. I've got um, it. Okay. I've got it. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So, you know, it's a kind of a, it's about Los Angeles and about both the kind of um, phoniness of some people in Los Angeles. And at the same time, it's about Los Angeles as a place. It's always a sort of a magical place to me. Um, I chose, so I wanted a Los Angeles charity as a way of sort of giving back or saying thanks to the city for having provided me with the setting. And it was, L, it was an LGBT center thing because I was thinking, well, this is a book about a character who, I mean, I never said, you know, he cross dresses. Right. And he's not gay. Um, he's not any label. I didn't write him in order to, you know, exemplify some label. I just had this character in my head and I just wrote the character the way I saw him. Right. But it seemed like I was thinking like, Oh, he is harassed all throughout the book and called names and things. And I was thinking, okay, is there a, is there a way that, that the sales of this book could do something about that kind of a problem? Like, is right. there a way, like what would he, what would he think was a good charity for his story to support? And I thought, I oh, want to pick the LG, uh, the LGTB center, LGTB center, BT center. So I'm sorry, Los Angeles LGBT Center. I'm screwing up your name. Um, it's been a long week. But the point is that, uh, yeah, I thought he would approve of that choice. And so I said, okay, that's that's the decision. That's where it should go. And I looked it up, and they, you know, they do a lot of things. They're not just like a clubhouse for people to get together. They give housing to people. They provide medical care. They help people who are unemployed find jobs, even to the point of giving them, like, professional outfits they can wear to job interviews and things like that. So it's a right. very comprehensive uh, it provides a comprehensive suite of services for a whole community. So I thought that was a good charity to, to approach. A very good charity. And again, I want to remind listeners, if you, if you pre-order the chat book, uh, you know, one third of all sales uh, benefit the Los Angeles LGBT center. Now, because of what's going on, uh, the printer that Nightscape uses, uh, they are, Tempor temporarily closed due to a stay at home order in their state. Um, we don't know when they'll reopen. However, if you go to nightscapepress.pub, nightscapepress.pub, and of course we'll have the link up on YouTube and the rest of our social media when this airs as well. But if you go there and pre order the chat book, uh, you will get an email to download the chat book electronically immediately. So you can. 
you can you can read it now and then you'll get the physical chat book when the printer opens back up so it's a really really good deal yep and it's it comes complete with illustrations and everything what you get by email is exactly what the printer got to print it from so you're getting That's... the professionally laid out book with the cover and the art and everything intact laid out it's not a, it's not a it's not an rtf file it's an actual no, it... It's yeah, actually it's, late. I can attest, you know, like I said, I, I've got one um, electronic edition. It's 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 a great story and it's it's a gorgeous production. Um, so I highly encourage that. Um, talking about other stuff that's coming out now, mm -hmm. I know that ethics. Is finished, but I yep. think the last I heard from you, you said that an agent told you ethics was unpublishable. That's Have you right. found a home for it? Yes, actually, Lovecraft Easy. Mike da Mike Davis has stepped up and oh, says, nice. Says he's going to publish it. He says he thinks that this book should deserves to be out there. He's you know he's got a his you know his son obviously has some problems and you know right. he's not exactly you know it's not like he can just whip out a book easily. But uh, I think well, last I heard the plan was to do it this year. I'm not sure where we stand on that right now, but I mean Mike and I are still in conversation about it, and so the idea is to get it get it ready to go. Uh, sooner rather than later but i mean again that's going to be his call and i'm totally fine with him doing it the way he wants to do it so uh, it's a it's a weird book and so it, it, i'm very you know we have cover art for it <clears throat> so you know that's that's been taking taken care of so we're now moving in the direction of getting it published i just don't know the schedule because of the coronavirus thing right all right well michael i really appreciate you coming on the show um when all this is over man Take the train ride down for the weekend. We'll get Tremblay down here the same weekend. Oh, nice. Um, you know, we'll 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 go through my whiskey collection. We didn't even get a chance <laughs> to talk about whiskey. Oh man. That's a whole other hour, man. I don't think you've yeah, that, that's a whole show in itself. But yeah, we'll we'll go through my whiskey collection and uh we'll talk more, man. Okay. All right, man. Thank right. you. I super appreciate this and I hope and please be well and give my Absolutely. best to you too. You guys stay safe. And once again, Michael Sisko's Do You Mind If We Dance With Your Legs? Uh, Pre-order it right now at nightscapepress.pub. Michael Sisko, thanks. Thank you very much. All right. So there you have it. Um, I want Again, I want to thank Michael uh, for, for his patience uh, as you heard, he and I talk about there, we, we had, it, it was a, uh, a long time getting that interview completed, uh, just because of what's going on in the world right now. Um, also want to remind folks once again, an evening with Victor Ravenscroft, AKA our own Matt Wildeson, uh, that's airing right now. Uh, wherever you listen to this podcast at, if you just search for Grindcast there and subscribe to Grindcast, you will get an evening with Victor Ravenscroft. Uh, this Saturday, I want to remind you again, CoronaCon. Uh, what time does that start, Kelly? Nine in the morning? 9.45, Joe Ripple will kick it off. And that's East and Coast. And Bob time. Ford yeah. is going to read first. So get out of bed, girls. I know you want to hear it. So that's, <laughs> that's 9.45 East Coast time? Everything is East Coast time, okay. yes. And Aaron Dries, who is in Australia and is 14 hours ahead of us, is participating so it'll be like 3 a.m. for him when he's on. So please don't leave him alone. Why would you oh, do man. that to Aaron? No, I asked if he wanted to be late at night or, or early morning. And he said he was a night owl. So he wanted to do the middle of the night shift. Yeah, I think he's usually awake then anyway. It's like, yeah, hey. he didn't want to be up at 7 a.m. He wanted to be uh, up at A.m. <laughs> 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 is bad. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh we got a bunch of interviews going on behind the scenes. I'm not sure which one of them we're going to air next week, but I guarantee you it will be somebody good. And uh, again, like I said, I'm, I'm going to do some research. I'm going to find out which publishers are actually shipping books themselves uh, so that maybe we can all forego Amazon right now and allow Amazon to focus on shipping, you know, necessities. I right. have just, just going to throw it out there. I have books because I was supposed to go to Wisconsin Scares. So if people were going to go to Wisconsin Scares to get books from me, I have books that I can sign and ship out. I got a ton of books too, but I'm not going to sign and ship. Yeah. <laughs> but I guys. There were a lot of people who were going to see me specifically there. Right. Right. And I mean, yeah. I have I have books too from when we were going to go to Air Studio. Yeah. 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 All so right. well, maybe ignore Amazon and go directly to the publisher and or writer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. 
All right, folks, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. The Horror Show with Brian Keene is a production of the Brian Keene Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. The Horror Show with Brian Keene is written by Brian Keene and produced by Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Matt Wilderson, and Dave Thomas. Our theme music is by Matt Hayward. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, Cosmic Shenanigans, Defenders Dialogue, and Grindcast. To advertise on The Horror Show with Brian Keene, visit briankeen.com and click Podcasts.